Oops, I should present. All right, and uh, welcome everybody. Tonight is the 17th of May. This is the Dallas Person Robotics Group Robot Builders Night Virtual, uh, where we build robots for fun. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. So there have been some questions about calendar, and we've had some changes come up. So we have Roborama coming up on the 18th of June. Uh, it's already posted on the club website, but not yet on Meetup. Uh, there's going to be Foursquare and what else, uh, Doug? Uh, he's muted, but there's three contests, I think, listed up there. Yeah. Four squares, six cans, not can-can soccer, six cans. And the, th the third one will be uh, uh, sample retrieval, which right. is what we're hoping to at least have one one uh, contestant, and that being the uh, Iron Ray. But, uh, yeah, I'd love cool. to try that, too. So where, it'll be interesting to see. Where is so, this, uh, where is the competition? It's going to be in the makerspace in the normal location. Uh, it's, what is the interactive room? And there's a if you go out on the website, the calendars for the day is all posted. And like and there's the club is going to be. Uh, supplying pizza i believe for the lunch so there's an incentive for you guys okay All right so. Um, so that was it uh for the housekeeping unless there's anyone else has anything to raise okay okay uh so we have on deck tonight we just go around the table so i have something to share first uh and then um then we'll uh, have Scott have something to share, and then we'll just take it after that as it comes. Um, so I'm going to ask you guys to pin my video. So let's see, is this working? The one that says it's. So, yeah, I'm trying to get this to work correctly. And it doesn't seem to be working correctly, aren't it? Um, I might have to do the alternate way. Uh, huh. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna scale back and go the other way. So give me just a moment to pull up the file, which is stored in some totally random location. Um, How's that for a total lack of preparation here? Mm -hmm. Of all the preparation I did, it didn't work out correctly. So um, almost there, here, and then here. All right, found it. So we're going to present this screen. And I hear somebody's sonar is just flying away there. Okay, Scott. now I hear them stopped. All right. That's Doug's clock collection. Oh, right. I believe okay. he just muted it. Okay, this is it. I about got it. Now, do we still have you pinned? Uh, you can unpin me, and I'm going to um, I'm going to fix uh, things here. Um, just goes to show. You're not going to mess up the recording, right? I mean, no, recording the recording to the video. Is, uh, the only thing is, is that, um, no, this will be okay. It just won't be quite as smooth as desirable. Okay. But it'll get the point across, I'm quite sure. Okay, here we go. Okay, so uh, so right after we did the club luncheon at Babes, um, we uh, went over the makerspace, and uh, I was practicing with uh, a robot, So this is uh, this is going to be my entry in Foursquare, and I'm going to do it in this mode right here. Spin mode. <laughs> yes, this is the way. This is the way Foursquare is supposed to be run. I think this is 
This is what I want to show. Carl, I think I can give you a run for your money. No, I'm sure you can, but uh, but watch this. I mean, I mean, for like the this was pretty much what the the second try. Wow, that's that's, that's not terribly bad. <laughs> Definitely get some style points. That gets a uh, a gold star to me. Yeah. Okay. Gold One gold that, star. That's impressive. Yeah. Now, um, well, I was thinking I wouldn't enter four square, but now you've given me incentive. Excellent. <laughs> Great. So would you guys like to see, I can also show you uh, one of the problems that I face here. So you'll notice that um, it's easy, it's possible to get to a place where the wheels spin and it doesn't move. So uh, mm. that's a... Uh, that's a little bit of a challenge with this thing. Yeah, the is floor, uh, the floor like slanted there? Like it's warped. Yeah, it's not uniformly flat. Yeah. So the best answer is probably to fix it with uh, suspension among or other feedback. But I have another thing that I'm planning to do. <clears throat> so uh, what I'm planning to do uh, because what you see in here, I don't know if you all uh, can see it well enough, but if you look closely, you can see at once the problem and a potential solution. Just stay away from that side of the, of the building. <laughs> right. Well, that's what we were thinking. That's why it started so much more to the left there, but it turns out that problem exists all over this floor for this little guy. Huh. Surprisingly, yeah. Well, and, th and that little guy has been a little bit worse than it used to be after it was dropped about a year ago by my lovely assistant. And then, because uh, it's just a flat metal plate and it's not quite as flat as it used to be. I'm not, I'm not sure. I still think you might be able to, to overcome a little bit by just loosening up the joints. You know, if, you, if you don't you know, start, if you don't start throwing screws. You know what I mean? There's mechanical solutions, but I have another thing that I'm planning. Would you like to hear what it is? Yes, it tell us. Somewhere. Tell us, so, Carl. Yes, Carl. I will call in the next couple of weeks. Now, I won't be able to do much in the next week, but in the next couple of weeks, I will call on none other than the mighty central limit theorem. Uh -oh. All right. And then... Um, what was the next part of this? That, that was that was really dramatic. I, I, think I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I will manipulate critical artifacts at the very core of the machine's intelligence. What was the last part? The last part is, you know, I'm not meant for the movies. The last part is, uh, oh yeah, yeah, and uh, I will harness the power of averaging. Okay. So do. what what movie is this from? I'm not recognizing it. <laughs> What's the key result of greater repeatability and even more cool factor when it moves? Okay. I'm, I'm preparing to be impressed. Cool okay. factor yet to come. <laughs> Stop it. Okay. I'm impressed with just the sound effects. That's it. I got nothing. I'm done. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a suspension problem. I'm going to fix it in the software. That's the bottom line. Or mask it. I don't know about fix it. So, Carl, are you using uh, an IMU for uh, your odometry? Yeah, depending on how you count it, there are um, either 6 or 14 sensors in there. So Ooh. there's a wheel speed. I, 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 uh, I measure the speed of each wheel, and there's four wheels. And I measure heading, so that's, I mean, that's five. But if you think about it, the heading is actually from a nine axis sensor. So there's, it's a, there's actually nine root sensors in there to give you one heading. But I only care about heading and the speed of each wheel. What kind and, of sensor are you using, Carl? And time, for what? Oh, it's a BNO 055 for the IMU in fusion mode. 
just in win or just in absolute mode? Absolute. Yeah, just heading. Absolute heading. Simple minded, just to see what I could do with simple minded. Simple -minded. It's amazing how amazing. accurate that thing is, just doing it that way. It's it's not always that way, um, and I will I will, after showing you one of the better runs, I'll show you one of the worser runs, which is why I want to do something about repeatability. Um, so where's the? Here we go. Okay. Yeah, I kept rebranding it. This time around, I decided to call it a man's way to do four square, but. And it should be, I got to work on this somehow, but I, I think it should be more or less move, the center of that ring is almost centered on the thing. So it should be moving kind of straight. So when you see wobbles and stuff, it's, um, it's an indication of some problem with the floor. So there might've been one that was even further off than that, but. And that's two two robots. Now what we saw, I think, was it looked like you were losing one axis. Otherwise, you know, when he he did it four or five times, and you you either lined up on the X or you lined up on the Y, and it was so you either get, you, there was something you couldn't get necessarily get both of them exactly right, you know. Yeah. That, that, and I can't, David, David you're muted. You're muted. Well, um, I didn't want to jump in ahead of Scott, but now that you inspired me, can, can I show a video? That's up to Scott. Scott said no. Yeah, sure. Oh. <laughs> you know, I, I, I made the comment a, a few weeks ago or you know, a month or two or back about the, the 055, especially like in absolute mode, like you're using it. And I found that it's it's fairly slow. So I think Pat, you were asking about you know the four square, and that I always see overshoot, and always seem to correct, and and I always attribute it to how slow the device is because you know you really I don't know three or four hertz maybe you're getting out of it right as far as an absolute location or heading, and you're spinning pretty good. So I would think your error would accumulate. And and that that's where your real challenge would come in at because you're you know like I said you're spinning pretty good, Carl. But I think for as fast as you're going, you're, you're yeah, it's pretty impressive that that's what you're getting out of it. It is surprising because there's no position at all. It's just velocity, heading, and time. And it's four separate wheel velocities, heading and time. Yes. So, so. Uh, and, and, and in terms of the lead, the um, delay you, you mentioned, um, I noticed that I had to put a lead in uh, when I when I maneuver it around X Y and that's when it's constant, got a constant spin going. I have to um, I have this concept of thr like thrust of, of which angle you put the forward motion in, yeah. uh, and. Uh, like if I want to go this way, but it's spinning at a certain rate, I have to like lead the thrust by a certain amount to get it to line up in time. Um, so if I want to go this way, I have to give it thrust. And depending on the spin, I have to give it a thrust in the, a little bit off filter. So there's some fudge factors in there. But but I haven't. The funny thing is, Scott, that you'd think the error accumulates on the heading. But um, I mean, You'll notice that when it comes back to the start, it, it aligns to north wherever that was when it started. And I, mean, I haven't tried well, that. What I, what I, my, my thinking of accumulating the error is that as you're moving, right? So you're typically going to be a little bit further around than what your, your 055 is telling you that you are. So as you're trying to make those calculations based on where I think I'm heading, you're right. Once you settle at the end, right, it's going to settle at, and it'll keep up with where it was to start with. I mean, it's really good at that. But as you're using it, and as you're making those dynamic calculations, as you're spinning, 
that's the that's the accumulated error that I'm refer, re referencing to because mm -hmm. you're always going to be a little bit ahead of of what you think your heading actually is supposed to be or yeah. what your where your rotational position is right you're I, in my opinion you're always going to be just a little ahead of that because your sensor's got to always catch up to it so yeah, if you're think, using that I think value that's... I mean, that, that would be my point. Yeah. But I think Carl's correction is probably taking that into account. I think that's what it, it is. Sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah, that I, I encountered the same thing. That is, uh, I assumed that the, that the drive would be the cosine of the direction you wanted to go. And it is, but I had to add a fudge factor to get it to actually go exactly. And I believe that fudge factor is taking into account that latency. Probably. Well, I, I'm. David, was, was it consistent? Uh, I'm doing this a little. Yes, it was. Uh, a little differently, uh, in that because I just have a two-wheel robot, the math is is a lot simpler. Uh, basically, you take the what would be like the normal Ross twist command, where you have a velocity and a rotation, and. Uh, you hold the rotation constant and you drive the velocity with a sine wave. And that sine wave is derived from the heading, which is you're getting back from the IME, plus this fudge factor, as I said. And, and, and I've got a video of that, which, which might answer the other question. If I can do this, let's see. You guys see a robot? Yep. Okay, well, this is a, the building where I work, and these are one foot square tiles. So, the way I line it up when I want to run these kind of things is I, I line up the center of the robot so that it's exactly over one of the corners of this. So, I've got basically the, I, I get the, the center axles when viewed from the top uh, over this line. And then there's a bolt that holds the front bumper on, and there's this bolt back here that I try. It looks like I'm off, actually, <laughs> from this one. So uh, before I run it, so basically I have this uh, pirouette function that just spins the thing in whatever direction you tell it, and then I've got that tapped into the normal uh, navigation, <clears throat> uh, the normal navigation algorithm. So it's just going to three waypoints here in the in the form of a of a right triangle where we started at the, the at the right triangle. And I think it's maybe four feet on a side. I don't know how smooth that looks to y'all, but uh, it actually decelerates as it comes to the waypoint because that's what the navigation function does. Of course, you've got so many crosshairs on this floor that how do we know you're going back to the same crosshair? Well, you go back and look at the beginning of the video and get your landmarks. Okay. I wanted to know, how do we know you're not controlling this with a remote control? <laughs> faith, yeah. Pat. That's where faith comes in. I'd almost, I'd almost give him points. If he could do that with a remote control, I'd almost give him points for that. I would absolutely yeah. give points. Good. That's why I said control. But what got me interested in this is because I've learned how to fly my helicopter like this, where I can go in any direction <clears throat> while pirouetting. But it's a lot easier with a helicopter because you just spur the sticks, as they say. <laughs> uh, 
that bad? Okay, yeah, there's those markers, the two sneakers. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> Definitely cool. Definitely cool. Nicely done. So now I think you'll beat me in time. I don't know. We'll see. We might have to have a special category. <laughs> Time versus accuracy. Although mine mine requires a, a severe degree of luck at the moment. So you said it was inconsistent, Carl. How how many runs did you do? And ah, uh, four or five. And uh, yeah, the most was a, a few robot lengths away, and you saw the closest one. Yep. Actually, he had one slightly closer, but he didn't record it. Oh, but, no. Thanks. <laughs> That's when we said, why don't you do that again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but record it this time. Well, well, one of the things I've been thinking about with this is that, you know, as I said, it's basically just running the same navigation algorithm that it would be if it was going in straight lines between mm -hmm. the waypoints. But, of course, the avoidance behavior doesn't work right right so i've been thinking about how to make the avoidance behavior work it seems like because it's spinning around and you know which direction you're going you know what quote unquote the front of the robot and that i could ignore all the readings except the ones when i'm facing the direction i'm going and then just maybe use the same algorithms i'm using now oh there you go there, there's going to be, because it's sonar, there's going to be uh, weird things because you're spinning. Um, but maybe it doesn't matter. I think as long as you stay away from weird things, you're probably okay. Yeah, if you could do avoidance in the middle of all that, too, that'd be pretty wild. Yeah, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> <laughs> Trickery. Okay, cool. Well, um, having said that, then, uh, Scott, I think... You had something? Well, I just, yeah, I, I was watching Jesse's <clears throat> presentation with the OP light. I've been playing with that for, for Belch. And I, I was thinking about, you know, training it to see a cone. But one of the things I saw in his video that he struggled with was different lighting conditions. And, you know, he even had to close the blinds at one point, you know, during the presentation. Um, so I was just wanted to kind of throw it out there, you know, how feasible is that? I mean, I, you know, when I was on the website there, you know, they got a video of them driving down the street, you know, recognizing cars and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, Jesse made the point of, you know, how tedious it was to train it and, to, and all of the pictures, you know, all of the, the scenes and, you know, variations. Um, because my original thought was that, you know, a cone should be fairly easy, right? I mean, it's going to basically be the same shape no matter which direction you're looking at it. Um, but I kind of got the sense from his presentation that that may not be the case and that, you know, other factors, you know, like the lighting um, is, you know, is a problem because, you know, that's the same issue I have with the pixie cam is you train it on a color, basically a color hue, but, you know, in direct sunlight, it almost looks white versus in the shadows where, you know, it looks more orange. So, um, you know, I just wanted to see, I don't know who's playing with OP lights or, um, you know, what the consensus is, whether or not it really even try to be practical to try to train it on a cone um, with, you know, all the varying background conditions and all that. Um, so I'm just curious of what people's thoughts might be if anybody's been messing with that. Um, well, I have been playing with some ideas on it. Um, okay, so I really kind of think of it as three groups, okay? One is you, you're you trying to pick a color with a blob detector. So there you're trying to do a blob. The second one is object detection, where you're actually trying to decide, I see this picture of something, and that's an object that I'm interested in. Right. Uh, okay. And then there is, I think, a third one, and if I understand it right, and I could be off, 
past, past cascade where you're really looking for the shape. Okay. Yeah. And that was the way I was interested. And there's actually on, I, I mentioned this before, where there's actually a very good YouTube video of a guy who did a Haas Cascade on traffic cones. On the way, so you can just go out there and read it. It's worth, it's, it's definitely worth looking at. Uh, but so, so the question is, which of those three is the most robust? Uh, you know, in theory, on your pixie cam, you got eight colors you could have picked. So you could you could wide you could selectively widen your windows if you wanted to. All right, because you don't you're only interested in one type of object. So you don't care if it's an object number uh, color number six or color number two. You don't really care. So you know, as long as they all. <laughs> You wouldn't want to get a two and a six that are in different locations. But. Yeah, you know, and, and that was one of the approaches I used last year yeah. um, because, you know, we're in the bright sun. Um, mm. But then, and I think there were a couple of people who had pixie cams that were picking up on the orange shed that was in the neighbor's property. Yeah. Um, and you, you don't know, know so what I, how I have it. Trying to move away from blob detection. Yeah. Um, although I've been playing with a Pixie 2 and I understand it's got, you know, better optics and better contrast. Yeah. Um, but when the contest was coming up in August, I thought, well, there's no way I'll be able to, you know, get this trained and, and get this worked out by then. So now that it's in October, you know, I, I don't know if that changes anything for me, but um, it still seems like a pretty steep hill to climb. You know, Jesse yeah. kept talking about how tedious it was. And I yeah. can just imagine. Well, I, like I say, uh, you know, when they're training the images, they they have like uh, settings where they take the same image, training image, and they change the contrast, or they change they change. There's a couple of things yeah, they was, change. Uh, yeah, website yeah. he was talking about multiplying the images or something. Yeah. Well, so what I'm trying to say is, I think your idea of you know taking a bunch of pictures of cones sitting out there in the bright sun. And a bunch of cones sitting out there in the in the shade, and you just conclude them all in your training set. Now that's the pain. The pain is having to to get all those pictures. And the way I was trying to do it is, uh, you can find scripts on the web. That guy that that uh, that YouTube video, he has a script that you could use. Uh, and, or you can use donkey car too, and you basically just drive it around, let it collect pictures to its, I think they call it a PUD, and you just let it collect pictures to the PUD, and yeah. then you just strip those pictures out and use them for your training. You say in, in donkey car, it's using, it's tying the PUD, pitch, PUD image to the steering setting and the, yeah. And, but, but you don't care about that because you, you're going to be driving it around with a controller. You know, you're just, all you're really trying to do is get get the pictures. And that's, that's so I think you could do that. But I don't think it's realistic. It would be not be realistic to try to capture all your images in one setting under one lighting condition. I think you're really going to have to set a, you know, probably take yeah. your cone, move it into the shade, then take it and move it into the sun and then put it in the bright sun. And, you know, I think you're going to have to do that. Um, put it under a tree where part of it is in the sun. And yeah. 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 Or, yeah. Or, or even Blah. dappled. Or Blah. dappled. Blah. Yeah. Well, well, you know, one of the things I noticed in Jesse's video was behind all of his signs, he had a solid background, right? There's either a box or a cabinet or something so that it wasn't, you know, the object wasn't really obscured by the background. And I think that that could be one of the bigger challenges in an outdoor mm -hmm. environment is you have just this uncontrollable variety of backgrounds. Um, well, well, that's what your uh, second part of your training set is supposed to help you with. Yeah. You have to have a none. You have to have, so so not only do you drive your, your vehicle collecting images 
of cones in different locations and distances and all that. But you also do the same run or, you know, something similar to it with no cone. Yeah. And that becomes your, your none pictures. And that helps it rule out the background. How many pictures do you think are required, Doug? I want to say that thousands. Now, I would say it's a couple, you know, a couple thousand, but, uh, it, it, you know, there is a point where you become overtrained. So I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I mean, I don't know for sure. But I, I, I want to I, say, I want to say that he, did he use, a, he used about 500. Wasn't that what he was saying? Some, I, I don't, I'd I don't have to look at his presentation. He gave a number, but. I, I would think it, it would be more important for, uh, you know, because one of the things Jesse was talking about was, you know, different angles of the sign, whether, you know, it was a direct angle or off to the side. Um, that's that's where the cone, the cone is better. The right, cone is it, totally so the cone is really not going to have that problem other than now you have the variety of lighting and backgrounds to complicate things. So. Um, yeah, that's why I, I hadn't gone down that path yet. I'm not. I'm still not sure I could uh, pull that off by even October. So, Scott, I, I'm kind of in the same place. Uh, you know, I've, I've got a couple of those cameras and I played with them a little bit. Um, it seems like okay. Going going back to uh, Doug's excellent three part examination, uh, the blob detection really works because this contest, which came from the Robo Magellan, was designed around those cones. For the early cameras, this international orange was real easy to recognize, as there's fluorescent green, for example, and fluorescent blue. And there's not much international orange in the real environment. So Except for Steve Water or Steve Sneakers. Yeah, exactly. But but in general, you know, it's a pretty good bet that if you've got an orange cone out there in the middle of a golf course, that there's nothing else orange anywhere nearby. So what I thought about the camera was, okay, let's go ahead and accept the fact that we're looking for something orange. I just want to have a little bit of improvement. I want to say I want an orange of a certain shape or something like that. In in the the camera that I use, which is the CMU Cam 2, so it's the predecessor of the Pixie Cam. I do three things to try to minimize those lighting changes. Uh, one is I use a, a neutral density filter. Uh, that's a camera filter. And the second one is, and you may do this also, I don't use RGB, I use uh, y, YUV. And YUV has the advantage that the color is specified in the U and V, and the brightness is, or is controlled by the Y. So you can get the color kind of narrowed down to what you want and then widen out the acceptable brightness for, for that particular color. And that helps. And then the third thing is that every time I take it out and do it, I take this <laughs> Kodak grayscale card and I have a routine in my robot. I push a button, I put this out in front of the camera and whatever that day's lighting conditions are, and I calibrate the camera. So I think it, I'm yeah. sorry. Say again. Set the white balance on it, basically. Yes. yes. And the and the contrast. Yeah, but what do you do on a partly cloudy day? Well, then you have uh, less brightness all overall, and so it, it calibrates slightly differently. What do you oh, do? I, mean, I was I was thinking of when a cloud. Do you have to time it for when a cloud comes over or when the cloud passes or when you do your 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 test? Well, I I have found that the I generally take it under a tree and hold the card out in front of it. So whatever, however bright the day is, I'm kind of getting an average of that from being under the, the tree. But I've got videos of the thing finding cones reliably that have, you know, leaves that give a speckled pattern to them. So it's multiple colors and it, and it still is able to find them. So I just wanted I, to improve on that. that. That was the idea with the camera. But I'm also actually kind of scared off by how much work it looks like in my declining years. Yeah, I mean, the the in your area kind of easy, you know? I mean, you're, you're talking about evaluating, you know, the raw image, where, you know, with, with the way I use the pixie cams, you just get, you know, the block count, 
um, as it's set up. But and, and that's why I was trying to get you know more sophisticated because I've seen several times where my where where Burple actually drives past the cone, and then in my search algorithm when it's trying to it's going around and circling, if it gets to the back side of the cone, a lot of times it would see it as the right color. Yeah, I've seen I've seen that too, where it would drive right past it. Yeah, and and you know I tried the neutral density filter as well, but I, I found that that just changed the scaling, right? When you your the problem is still that you're going from a bright condition to a light condition, so a neutral density filter helped me catch it more in brighter conditions, and then you would miss it in darker conditions, and vice versa without the filter where more you would see it in darker conditions because you know and it all depends on how you train the camera and like doug was saying as you open up because you can even set the contrast and i think there's a i forget what they call it in the pixie world the, the scale or the the fudge factor or whatever um and i've played with that too but then you start getting the false positives like i did last year and you know it was trying to drive over to the shed on um, you know, is the neighbor's property. So, um, I don't know. It's just been a frustrating thing. I've been trying to find a better solution and yeah. it seemed like, you know, doing the object detection you know, resolved the, the brightness issue. Um, you know, I, I like the idea of, of, you know, shape detection because the cone would be, should be fairly easy because your perspective is always going to be the same and your geometry of the cone itself from your perspective is always going to be the same, no matter which direction you're coming up to it from. Um, so that may be a suggestion I'd look at, because I've got the, the 3D camera that I'm using, and um, I've got some algorithms set up for, you know, to use like hot spots for uh, almost like mimicking the, the uh, sonar, where you have a sonar array and you get a cone of data out of each sonar. So that's kind of the same way I've used all of the data on the 3D camera is I, I put them into regions and I said, okay, what's the average of this region and what's the shortest distance of this region? And I kind of use it the same way I did my sonars in my obstacle avoidance um, by just using, you know, areas. And then I can play around with what area that I'm looking at. Um, and I haven't really taken a lot of time to do field testing and, you know, set up obstacles. But so far, it seems like it's, it's the right path to go. But... Um, you know, it's almost time to get this thing out, put some wheels on it, and then, you know, give it some trial runs. I've been working on it long enough. Okay. Are you going to go with the Pixie Kim? Yeah, right now I probably am. Um, I don't know, you know, how, yeah, I just don't know if I'll be able to get the training done. You know, that's a, like I said, that's a big hill to climb. And um, I'm not sure I'll have that much time to put into it. So, yeah, I'll probably... I've got a Pixie 2 that I can put on it. You know, the, it, the adverts are, you know, it's better contrast protective and, you know, the, it's a better sensor. So um, I think I'm going to try that this year and, and, you know, maybe future plans to put the, you know, do the training on it because I'd like to do a lot more with the camera, you know, to interact with the environment more, you know, follow a human or, you know, avoid humans or whatever. Um, you know, it's really interesting technology I've, I've seen a couple of the you know examples that they've put up in some of the um not the blob files but you know the the, the detection files that you can kind of load into it um and you know jesse's presentation really inspired me and i was i was really impressed with what they were able to do and i think he did that in a pretty short period of time too didn't he yeah he was pretty he was pretty much under the gun yeah. uh, and now there's another thing, too, that uh, i got two points I'd like to bring up here. Uh, uh, when Kareem runs the sample retrieval, we can easily pick his mind and get him to give us a presentation. Because so, those guys have done object detection before. All right. So we could get hold it, bring them in for a presentation and have them really give us a yeah. I mean, I would be interested in seeing the actual training process. You know, that was one yeah, thing. Yeah, me didn't too. Cover that much. You know, it's like he, he kind of hit on it, um, but he never really got into details. You know, these still photos, did you take them with the, the OP camera? Um, 
you know, what was the actual process? You know, he, he kind of mentioned several tools that he used, yeah. but you know, I, I would, you know, I was trying to follow some of his links and, you know, like I said, it's a big hill to climb. So anybody's, you know, experience well, and help would certainly be. I bet that's another thing we could do is we could ask Jesse to come back now that he's not holding back because of competition. And now that he's got time to think about what happened and he might be able to, and we'll tell him, we, we want to know this part of it, you know, the, yeah. the training part of it. Maybe well, you know, could... I did go on and vote for him and his team. So. Me too. Me too. <laughs> me too. Yeah. Well, let me, let me tell you, did our uh, best. you know, the people who've got the, the OD light, I believe the price of the OD light is $149, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so it's $149. But I was thinking about this the other day. If you were to buy any cheap camera for your your Raspberry Pi, that's, uh, what, $25, $30, mm. right? Then you had to buy your Movidia stick, which is $80. So now you're up to 110. You know, the price between $149 with stereo and all of their examples and everything, and you trying to buy just the components, that's not even counting if you had to buy a Raspberry Pi. That's actually a damn good price. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just well, something this, to think about. Yeah. Is this, the, is this the justification really you'd use to, you know, suggest that it's okay to your to your wife that you buy one? You know, it's like, honey, no. look, if I buy all these other things, <laughs> look how expensive they're going to be. <laughs> no. No, okay. okay. But, hey, Jack. Jack, I see you in there. Question. Who's that man behind that pegboard there? Yeah. Hey, Jack. Yeah. Uh, you do know we're doing a six-can competition next month. No, I didn't. Uh, yeah, like a couple of weeks from now. No. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, All right, I'll have to sign up for that. Okay. I just wanted you to know, go to the website and uh, All right. I'll give you a chance to, I know you completed it last time, or at least got, I think you got four cans, right? Well, yes. Go for yes. It. This yeah. time, go for it. Okay. All right. All right. Just okay, wanted to make you. sure you knew that because I didn't know, don't always see you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I had one other uh comment i wanted to it looks like we lost scott did we lose you uh, he's, yep. uh, he's probably got a chair yeah now just a chair well he gets to miss it then um the reason that i went with the neutral density filter on the camera i have is because that camera i really think was designed primarily to work indoors and outdoors the uh, it just overdrives it so easily so what he described, basically moving the whole response curve down is, is actually what I was trying to do to keep it from, uh, things would turn white, you know, when they get over driven. Well, on the Pixie cam, you do have control over the brightness. You can adjust the brightness. Yeah, and you can do yeah. that on the fly, can't you, Doug? Uh, you, yeah, software. Yeah, 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 software. You can't, do, you can't do it by their setting, though. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, they have a setting, uh, what they call a they have a an app called Pixiemon, and in that you can't you can set the brightness, but you can't do it dynamically. Oh yeah, um, you can. Okay. Yeah. In the bright in the Pixiemon. Yeah. That, well, I in my Pixie interface, um, I actually have a photo cell. Oh yeah, I, yeah. I three D printed like a tube so that if there was direct sunlight on the camera, it would you know. Uh, because it's an analog, it's just a photo cell. Um, and then based on that, that photo cell, then I adjust the brightness on the camera. So yeah, I, I stole that as, as I'm running through. And that really helped when I went from like shadow to sun. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, when you went back to, to shadows, you know, it didn't seem to really make a whole lot of difference, but um, but yeah, that was that was an improvement I made, and and it got marginally better, but um, you know it's still a challenge. I think another another thing I did that maybe along the same lines is I have a like a sunshade over the 
camera, so it, just so I can't see very high. This uh, is my version of your thing, Scott. This is the the cell. Yeah. It leads to the cell, and they're actually buried inside yeah, behind the, the sunglass. Yeah. Yeah, and this is polarized. Yeah. It's a it's out of one of those three D three D glass yeah. glasses. So. Scott, that's, what I was saying, the reason that I had that I used the neutral density filter was because that camera just overdrives. Uh, you know, when you can adjust the the uh, brightness of it, but that's basically you know after it, the photons hit the screen or hit the detector, and it's just overdriving the detector. So, and the other thing I did, let's see, can I present here? Allow. Don't know if you can see here, but the the camera the camera has a sunshade on it. Mm. Yeah, I, I I remember the the little almost like a, a hat bill thing over it. Yeah. See if I can get a better. Oh look, see there's a orange cone with a uh, with a. Uh, let me back that up. Just what we were talking about. It's got shadows and direct sunlight on it can't really see it very well here, but it makes it flash around different colors of orange. So, okay, you can, you can, yeah, you can see it there, there. there. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that not only keeps it from, uh, uh, keeps the sunlight off, but it also uh, keeps it from seeing the sky, which can be really bright. How come I have no stop presenting button? Well, you're in the wrong window, maybe. Oh, yeah, you got you got window, 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 window. It's gonna take you a while to find the right one. Boy, that's yeah. a <laughs> number of choices there. I don't see any stop presenting button. Isn't it the, the start presenting one? Go left to the three dots. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Ah, sure, that's good. Ah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Tragedy averted. There you I thought go. it was in the matrix or something. Mm -hmm. Isn't that left in the 333 dots? Anyway, they, these things are very handy. You can get them at almost any photography store if there are any of those left. Oh, they're still around. Here's and mine. Just tell them you want a, yeah, a Kodak grayscale card. Yeah. This so back to the lanyard so you can conveniently carry it on you. Back to the pixie cam. You you cannot adjust the brightness on the fly. I've never tried to do you, it. You you can do it in the program. Otherwise, oh, you, you in their API, you have the ability to adjust the brightness. Right in pixie. So, mode. Yeah. No, yeah. No 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 no. In the program in the pixie mine, you can set the brightness. Okay. But that's running on your PC. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's or, part of the the communications interface just like operating the servos and there's um well oh, okay. too there's you can turn the leds on uh, so that's just part right. of it's one of the commands in their standard interface yeah. yep okay in other words the, you can get the x value the y value the centroid yeah. all that stuff and brightness yeah brightness yeah well, you get you, you you know you request the blocks, so then you get the x, y, and the width and height of the block, right? And then you get an array of those, and then there's um, you can set the brightness. I think you can. I'd have to look at the interface, but I think you can set the contrast. You can do. You can operate the servos. Um, okay. You know, just like the example code does. Um, it's all part of the interface, whether you're using the UR or the SPI or the iceberg C, it's just one of the commands. There's not a lot of commands, but, but that's, um, those are in there. Well, Scott, it also might be, at least I'm convincing myself that this fairly simple task of finding, you know, bright orange traffic cones out in the middle of green fields might actually be best solved with a pixie cam. But when we start looking at want to recognize more complicated objects yeah. that don't have this intrinsic advantage of being the only bright orange thing in the in the field of right. view. Yeah, like I've always dreamed 
that blob color blobs are not going to do it when you're trying to pick out you know specific mm -hmm. objects. Nah. Uh, yeah. The I've always have uh, dreamed that we would eventually get to like the one that NASA did, where, you know, where they they had four or five objects and they didn't even tell them what they were. You know, they just stuck them out there on a field. Their field was like an acre and a half or something like that, and the robot had to go out and find things of interest, you know, and bring them back. And that was kind of cool. But, you know, we probably wouldn't get there, but we might say, well, we'll have Easter eggs or something. You know what I mean? You gotta go collect your Easter eggs and uh, be fun. Moving on, you know, but first let's get the, where we get, everybody gets a nine. That's what we need to do. I'm kind of wondering, like with a uh, OpenMV H7 or uh, the Max Pi, if you could do blob detection and just look for, you know, a geometric shape, a triangle. Well, Carl, wasn't that what? I, the, I think I think that's what I'm saying. That's if you. Uh, you wasn't can, that what uh, Raj was doing? Don't know. Somebody don't know. gave us a presentation where they showed how it would, if it was cone shaped, it would say that's it and if it was like a flat disc of orange on the ground it would say that's not a cone yeah like in in the algorithm that uh raj put in uh yeah. tape and bailing wire uh it looks for an orange blob of a certain aspect ratio so it's not strictly yeah. cone shaped it's looking for a certain aspect ratio yeah. and it would it would false trigger in my office here on that on bits and pieces of that um childhood red painting oh you can see between the blue and the, the different black and color with the red background parts of the red background were detected as a cone because uh, they had about the right aspect ratio yeah but I, I don't see why you couldn't mix and match and combine well yeah that it it's better than the just looking for the orange blob by itself yeah yeah. Or a triangular shape by itself. Or a triangular shape. Yeah, you could look yeah. look for triangles. You could look look for aspect ratios. You could look for colors. And if you if you have all of those things at once in the same bounded box. Yep. Yeah, and you say, well, it actually doesn't have to be exactly the right color of orange, just like it doesn't have to be exactly the right shape. But if right. those two are close, it's probably a cone. Yeah. Yeah. Invoke some fuzzy logic. It's all I have left. <laughs> it's all fuzzy. I was going to ask if you guys uh, down south have the same problem as we have up here in October, and that is that trees and bushes turn orange. Yes. Well, what trees and bushes we have? It's yeah. not that, around by that time. That uh, that video I was just showing in my front yard. Uh, there was one video I ran where it was going along just fine, headed toward the cone, but then it saw these nice orange berries on the bush. And they were closer and looked so scrumptious, it just went straight in toward those. And of course, the, the avoidance pushes it away from the bush, so it's very confused now. It's like offering your dog a treat, but not, not letting him have it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also, Pat, we go from green to orange, to rust, to brown in about a week and a half. Yeah. So it, yeah. it doesn't last long around here. <laughs> oh, we've got a couple weeks of uh, it, orange and yellows and about about a week of bright oranges, a week and a half. Yeah. And then it just, everything dulls out and gets to yeah. yellows and brown. I did have a problem one time running uh, the robot in a park where they were doing some construction they had some of that orange netting that they had part of it roped off with. And uh, I actually s spent some time working on the algorithm to not be fooled <clears throat> by something that large, basically. You're talking about like the orange snow fence? Yes. It's it a plastic, plastic, sort plastic of extruded. And it's the, uh, that same international orange. So, but I did put in some rudimentary it can't possibly be a cone if it's that big code. 
Well, I did that after Ray cheated and said, well, if, if the can, <clears throat> if the can's above this far in the screen, then it's not really a can. It's got to be down here. <laughs> where did he work for just a little while yeah, after yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> work one. <laughs> but I'm not bitter about it or nothing. No, no. <laughs> Doesn't even remember it. No, barely. <laughs> cool. So, Jack, is is that pegboard going to produce a cup of coffee? Who's hiding behind? That was it's kind of funny. I was wondering if you make him appear. Yeah, I'm uh, hoping to. I'm hoping within a couple of weeks I'll be able to get it to uh, at least make some chocolate milk since I don't have a coffee machine for it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, hopefully show a demonstration of uh, some of some of what it can do right now in a little bit. But uh, actually, probably could right now if no one uh, needs to talk. Hey, if you're game, give it a shot. All right. Like a large grande latte with a double, I don't know. That's what I'm hoping for. You're going to work. Big goal <laughs> will be a uh, mocha. Okay. Are you, are you going to do those little patterns at the top? No, I thought about it. But I'd have to cheat kind of in order to do so with like, when they sprinkle the sugar on instead. Now it's just calibrating. And then right here is where there's usually a stack of cups. So it's going to go grab a stack of cups. And then it's going to move on to the syrup se section, which will come out of this tube. And Jack, could you move the, to hold it straight. What? Could you aim the camera down a little bit? Oh, oh, sorry. I'll start over. Yeah, we're missing the business part of it. Yeah. All right. There and we go. Now we got it. Oh, yeah. All right. It's calibrating this. Or, oh, I know what went wrong. Now it's calibrating. And now it's grabbing the cup. Oh. Oh. That's strange. It's the only thing that hasn't not worked. All right, so here's the syrup dispensing part where we'll come out this little tube. And I've got a little uh, peristaltic pump behind the pegboard that will pump out the syrup. That takes... Uh, Right now I'm considering if it's adding any sugar, which for me would take a while. And then it, then it moves on to the uh, mixing station where I've got this uh, mixer hidden behind this uh, case there. So then, uh, because I'm going to have a uh, water spout, hopefully, on the back that will clean off the mixer when it's done. Right? Hmm. Oh, there we go. So it starts mixing up. I think I'm going to need to get a different motor control because it seems to, doesn't seem to work right. I was just using a transistor, but 
some reason it's causing this jittery problem. It's very hard to control the power. So then it moves over to this station, Pretty which noisy. would typically have caps. But this is this part uh, I'm working on right now. See, it didn't work there. And then the final station will be the uh, cap press, where it will drop the cup and press. Use this uh, linear actuator to press on the cap. Cool. Thank you. Jack, does the hopefully uh, that should be running soon. For the mixer, does the yeah. does the mixer come down or does the cup go up? I couldn't quite tell. The cup goes up. Cup goes up. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. See, I don't think you I had that uh, functioning before. No, I think the last time I showed you guys, you were I really just, had just the out. two cup dispensers. Cups, right? Mm -hmm. So bravo, bravo. Oh, thank you. It's good. Thank you. Is that a latte star? <laughs> I was going to say the first time you run it, uh, or before the first time you run it, go to IKEA. They have these long trays. That we we use them for boot trays, but you know if, you, if something goes wrong, you know you're going to have liquids and hot, you know. Oh sugar yes. And, you know everything. Yes, so that's catch a good it in idea. the tray. <laughs> All right. <laughs> mm. They're pretty cheap. All Four right. bucks, I think. What is yeah, it? I have the equivalent of a uh, pan for under your car under my lathe so that all the, the crap that comes off of it. <laughs> yep. So you're saying your car marks its spot, huh? No, uh, but I got that kind of a pan. Oh, yeah. It was at Walmart or someplace like that. I put yep. it under my lathe it gets all the drippings and stuff. Yep. Gosh, Dave, I, I just snuck into the kitchen and made off with a cookie pan. It's the equivalent of a very large cookie pan. Yep. I paid the price the next time I wanted cookies. Probably had an oily mecha uh, mechanical or uh, metallic taste, rather. No. <laughs> All right, so how are we doing here? Uh, any, other, any other demonstrations? Any other ways we can convince Jack to uh, build more stuff in his family's living room? I'm very surprised. They're, they've been very good about this. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> I, th I think it has to do with um, enjoying that time that's remaining before the kiddos fly mm. to keep so oh i bet they're really proud i bet they bring too. their friends <laughs> in and say look what he's working on now they actually take a bed sheet and cover it up when they got <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome i'm guessing it's easier to get support out of your parents than it is your wife <laughs> yep yeah I'm this is my my office is my fishbowl. I can't I can't go beyond it, you know. So, <laughs> of course, I do have the metal building too. So, Doug, you've got a dog to share, and you're muted. I think. Yeah, I I thought that was an interesting uh, interesting article about they were going to make that dog explore the moon and uh, I quit sharing my screen I just was kind of peeking at it I put the the link in the chat all right we're gonna send it autonomously out into the one of the southern craters and look for water and stuff and uh, like you say look for something interesting and bring it home I'm gonna use that four-legged dog technology that some of the other people have done it won out over tracks and wheels Oh, so like Boston Dynamic Spot then, huh? Sort of like that. I figured while everybody was just yakking, I'd pop it up there.
So is it somebody else's quadruped? Or is it uh, well, let's see. It says it's called Glimpse, and it's created by University of Zurich. Oh. Probably not Spot. Though. You know, that just got me to thinking. I was looking at that dog, and, uh, and I'm like, that's cool and all. If they want to track on the moon, how do you go about... How do you go about stimulating all the UV radiation and all the other junk and micrometeors and dust? You know, what I'm, you get what I'm saying? How do you stimulate all that? I mean, there's got to be ways. And I guess we know because we've been there to go figure it out. But there's a lot of different environmental chambers. Yeah, there's got to be a lot, right? You got the yep. vacuum thing. You got the hard vacuum. You got the quasi thing. You got, you got to do something to figure out. Uh, lower gravity in a certain way. I mean, that's, that seems like a simple matter of me of, of counterbalancing the weight off the thing and, 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 and producing that. But and that you might be a problem all with itself. Just radiation out. hardening, Harold. You got yeah. radiation hardening because in space and on Mars, there's not like there's not an atmosphere that's yeah. chopping down the radiation, and, and um, solar radiation has a tendency to go in and at least disrupt the states of transistors if not damage the yeah. silicon stuff, right and that's and that's a spe that's increasingly so when you have these super fine geometries like on our gigahertz processors of the day yeah the close the, 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 the closer you make those traces the easier it is to mess them up right yeah the fewer uh wavelet particles it takes to disrupt oh, yeah, yeah yeah even just even though even just you know you know a, a, a electricity running through a wire room Will create something of a of, of some sort of field that inter interfere. You know, it ain't much, but when we're talking nanometers, it don't have to be much, right? Right. That's it up. That might be a fun <laughs> job all in itself is just to sit around and figure out a test thing. <laughs> There's businesses that do that. All righty. Well, um, Open floor, going around the table. Are there any other items? Um, I will tell you, um, Ubuntu Raspberry Pi camera that you insert in it, um, not an easy thing. Raspberry Pi OS, it just works. <coughs> no. I, I fought with it a couple hours last night, and I, we, at the end, we figured it out by doing something really, really hacky that makes me feel just a little dirty, like I need to, I'm not Catholic, but I need to go to confessional anyway, <laughs> that's the way it works, um, uh, but I, um, oh, I, will say, I am locked up. I, I will say something, though, about the latest, some of the latest cameras that they're selling like Articam. I had trouble with this in the last few weeks. Um, Artic Articam has started selling cameras that will uh, that will not work with the Bullseye OS without some additional effort. Apparently, in, in Bullseye, they've, they've changed the entire camera stack on the Raspberry Pi. Hmm. Yeah, it's so, with the lib with the lib camera. Yeah, with the lib camera. There's a way that you can still use the legacy stack. Um, there's a, a utility called uh, Live Camera Camerify, Live Camerify. If you run that before you run the command to, to access your camera, it will uh, it'll work. Yeah, I'm, I've actually tried to be, did some playing around trying to make, see if I could, how I could get Lib Camera to work well. And I don't think it's really, I mean, it can do everything that you would want to do with their little, their little apps that they provide you with, but uh, there's no API to do it. You know, it's, it's, it, I don't think it was ready. I, I don't know why they did that. Uh, I, I mean, they, I'm not saying it isn't a good thing. It actually, it actually brings the ability to bring new cameras in very easily, but but I don't think that uh, 
they were ready to put it on the pie. I think they should have held off. Yeah, but well, that's just fine. It, it certainly caused me a lot of grief for a few weeks trying to figure out what I was doing wrong. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I've been there. I know what you're talking about. Well, if, if you buy a pie camera on Amazon, just be sure to look at the fine print. You know, if they say only works with bullseye, you know, in the fine print, then you know you have a little extra work to try to get it get it to work for you. Yeah. yeah. The older cameras, will that work with bullseye? Yeah, well, it'll work with lid camera, but but what you probably what I would suggest today is if you were using the new software is to get, like uh, John mentioned, there's a way to bring in the legacy stack because uh, you know all of the all of the scripts that you're going to find on on the internet use the legacy scrap uh, uh, legacy uh, uh, scripts and Demand so whatever. very little functional crap is out there for lib camera yeah I think there's, this. there's two situations you have to watch out for you have an older camera with the bull's ios or you have a newer camera with buster os yeah um so that's what those are the two combinations you have to watch out for if you have a if you have an older camera with bullseye the newer os there's if you go into your um you go into your uh your preferences you go into your your raspy config there is a new setting in there in the advanced interface options where it says legacy, uh, legacy camera interface where you can you can enable the legacy camera interface okay you just have to be aware of that you know when you mm. try to use a, a camera in that situation yeah. and in the opposite extreme <clears throat> if you have a new camera with the older os then no, i'm sorry Yeah, you can run the. I, I have to go back and remember how it's done, but there's a lot of live camerify that you run. Like if I'm running motion, if I if I append live camerify in front of motion, basically it runs a script that gives you the compatibility to to run with the motion software. Yeah, so you're saying that the. Uh, I mean, that was why the the give them flexibility of cameras was why they wanted to do it. So that must mean that the new cameras are uh, some different sensor or something that they don't have the legacy support for. Uh, except, John, you said there's a workaround. So yeah. uh, I guess the question I have is how are the new cameras marked? Did they, did they have like version 1.4, version 2? Well, as a matter of fact, I had 